Vale, se oye, sí. Vale, eh, estaba pensando que lo, con lo último que ha añadido el señor, eh, que, que, que decía como que cada uno puede tener su punto de vista, ¿no? Explicar su perspectiva de qué sentido tiene la vida uniendo todas las, las corrientes, ¿no? La ética, la moral, la política, la, la ciencia. Pero si cada uno tiene su punto de vista, al final, ¿cree que se puede llegar a un punto en común o hay alguna verdad o...? Thank you. Um, it's a very good question. Um, as I said a moment ago, I, I'm, I'm not commending relativism. I think this, you think that, we can't prove it, so let's just do what we like and think what we like. What I'm saying is that truth is something that's very important. It's also something that's very hard to achieve. And that's why, uh, in many ways, I, I'm saying each of us has faith in a certain way, that actually we believe that certain things are right because we can't prove them to be true. But I'm not saying that that means you just um, say each of us has our own way of thinking and we don't talk about this. Because in my own case, you know, I began by thinking in a very atheist way and I moved away from that. And that was partly because I, I read books, I was in conversation with other people, I was being forced to think about perhaps two questions. What are the reasons for thinking this is right? And if this is right, what are its implications? In other words, thinking through questions like that. So uh, there's no way I'm saying that we simply um, end up believing anything we like. However, you will know, I'm sure, that there's a very large psychological literature which says that actually a lot of people do decide what they would like to be the case and then kind of provide rationalization for that after. In other words, uh, Jonathan Haidt, a very interesting American psychologist, uh, has talked about very often we make decisions about what is right or what is good on emotional grounds. And then we provide rational justification for that. But the reason came second, the emotions came first. I think it's very important to be aware of that. But your point is, is good. We don't give up on the quest for truth. We say, I have to somehow be accountable for what I think. I can't just believe anything. There needs to be some base of evidence, something deeper than that, which actually governs what I think. And that's one of the reasons why I, I think it's very important to recognize both the limits placed on us. We cannot absolutely prove things really matter, but nevertheless, we can do our best to show that we have good reasons for what we think and know what those are. And so in many ways, what I'm saying is something I had to, to, to do myself, which is to think through what I actually believe, what reasons I might give. If I was debating with Richard Dawkins, how I would defend my Christianity against his atheism, uh, because there's no way I'm saying that Dawkins and I simply have different perspectives on this question. You know, it's, it's a bigger question than that. And so I think we, we do need to think about that. But I was just being very realistic and making the point that actually with these big questions of life, it's sometimes hard to prove what we believe. But I want to see that as something that's positive. And I, I realize many people are saying this, this sounds negative. You're simply saying we can't prove anything, so what's the point? I'm not saying that. I'm saying it is really important to think these things through and give reasons what you believe. But here's the point. It's simply not true that, an a that atheism is a fact and, for example, belief in God is a faith. Actually, as I look back on my own life, my atheism was a faith. I chose a different faith because I began to realize I couldn't prove what I believed as an atheist. And therefore, it wasn't factual. It was actually a matter of faith. Now, this is important because I mentioned Richard Dawkins a moment ago. And um, you can see this video online if you want to. But in 2011, I think, Richard Dawkins debated with Rowan Williams, who was a very significant religious thinker and leader in Britain. And at one point, they came to this question when Dawkins was saying, you know, I want you to prove what you believe to Rowan Williams. Uh, Williams, in effect, asked him if he would like to do the same thing. In other words, to use the same criteria to judge his own views. And Dawkins, in effect, said, well, I, I can't. I can't prove I'm right. Uh, in a sense, I'm an agnostic. And the person chairing this discussion was one of Britain's leading philosophers. And he really 
entered into the discussion here and said, you realize you are saying you cannot prove your atheism, even though you are saying to Rowan Williams that, that his vulnerability was he couldn't prove what he believed and, and was very unhappy about this. But I think it, it makes the point. The point I'm really making is atheists often criticize Christians because they believe things. My point is, actually, everyone believes things. We're all in the same boat. Therefore, the question is not faith or fact. It's actually all of us have to choose which is the best faith and not worry that we cannot prove our core beliefs. We need to ask how good they are. That's a different question. Thank you. Vale, mi pregunta sería que antes hemos hablado de cuatro preguntas, que es quién soy, eh, verdaderamente importo, y luego otras dos que derivan más de la segunda. Ah. Vale, vale. Eh, bueno, antes hemos hablado de cuatro preguntas que tiene uno que hacerse, y la segunda de ellas era la de si realmente importo y si realmente importamos. En el caso de que la respuesta fuese no, o encontrases tú como respuesta no, ¿cómo podrías responder a las dos siguientes preguntas? Thank you. Um, yes, the second question was, you know, do we really matter? Are, are we significant? And the answer is, um, I think your answer to that question is very important for dealing with the next two. You know, for example, um, uh, the question of, of um, purpose. You know, if, if I'm unimportant, well, it doesn't matter what I do because it's of no significance. And I think that is all, that's very important in relation to agency as well. Can I make a difference? Well, if I'm insignificant and unimportant, who cares whether I can make a difference or not? I think it's a very important point. And so the issue then is really this question you've raised, which is, do I matter? And interestingly, I mean, that's not really a scientific question. It's a deep existential question. It's a very important question. I mean, one of the reasons that existentialism became so influential as a philosophy is that people felt that um, a very objective scientific answer to a question didn't actually engage something deep within us which really mattered. And of course, this is a very good example of that. You know, am I important? Because you know, scientifically, I mean, you and I both share the same condition. We are one of a very large number of human beings. So in what sense are we significant at all? There's simply so many of us. Why do we as individuals think we might be important? Well, the answer is because something deeper within us is saying, actually, we do matter. And existentialism is really picking up on this and saying there is something about each of us which really does matter. And of course, it's to do with um, this feeling of significance. Now, I mentioned Albert Einstein earlier. Let me, let me come back to him because he's very interesting on this. Um, Einstein has this idea, you know, we have these world lines. That there's x, y, x, y, z, t, then there's x1, y1, z1, t1. And that's a different place, except um, at this point in time, I'm dead. At this point in time, I'm alive. And so actually, it's not purely objective, because it actually has this deeper existential significance. And um, Otto Neurath, a very famous Austrian scientist, talked to Einstein a lot about this question. And he said, look, Einstein's physics couldn't answer the question, why do we feel our own individual existence is important? And, and Norat said that Einstein was convinced there had to be an answer to that question, but here's the point, it lies beyond the scope of physics. So it's very important. So, you know, we, we, we have this need to think about who we are and why we matter, but physics science doesn't really help us there. It has to come from somewhere else. Now, if you're a Christian, you know, there's a, there's a very powerful answer, and you find it in Psalm 8, that the God who made all of this stuff also made us, and we matter to God individually. But that's not a scientific truth. You know what I'm saying? It comes from somewhere else, but it does kind of come together and give you this deeper and richer vision of reality. And it is important, and one of the things that really interests me is the way in which in English culture at the moment, this point is being given greater recognition. There was an autobiography recently by a leading feminist writer. Um, the, the title of the book is Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal. Uh, it's, a, it's a lovely title. Uh, but she says, look, um, we cannot simply eat, um, exist, and procreate 
we are meaning-seeking animals. And she says that until we, find, we feel we have satisfied these deep existential questions, we can't really live properly. And she's not answering the question. She's just saying there's something about us which makes us ans ask these deep questions and hope that there are real answers to give. And what I'm saying is uh, I, I, you know, there are ways in which we can answer that, but science on that specific question isn't really going to give us a good answer. But there are other answers that can be given, and they can be interlocked with scientific answers to give a deeper and richer answer than science is able to give on its own. Thank you. Well, I'm going to try in English. Um, my question is about the first question we talked, the question of who I am. And if we are not just atoms or molecules, as you say, because we are different from the glass of water, um, how can we exactly know who we are? I mean, uh, how can we reach to the answer? Well, that's a very good question. Um, it would take a long time to give a good answer, so I'm going to give you what I hope will be a short answer. I mean, one of the answers that I would begin to give to this question, this is a very good question, and you phrased it very well, is that um, there is something about us as human beings which, means, which makes us feel we are significant, but locates that significance not simply within ourselves, but in our relationships. And therefore, you know, our relationship with our parents, with our friends, with our lovers, these are all very important. They help identify who we are. And it's why religion fits into this picture very, very well, because particularly in Christianity, you have this very strong idea of a God who relates. In other words, not a distant, abstract, philosophical idea, but rather some sort of attending presence in your life. And you might think of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And it goes on to talk about that God being with you wherever you are, wherever you go, in the good times, in the bad times. And so maybe thinking about relationality, this remarkable ability of human beings to form relationships which actually help determine who we are and help us find meaning, that is actually really very significant. It means that actually we begin to find this meaning in a set of relationships with people who know us, who love us, who care for us, who we know and love, and actually that God is, is part of this. And uh, there is a book that does talk about this. It's by a, a German philosopher called Martin Buber. It's called uh, Ich und Du, uh, I and You. But it, it, he's simply saying that what we really need is not to live in a world where everything is an it, an objective reality which makes no difference to us, but rather a you, in other words, a relational reality. That's where we find significance. And so we find significance partly in those who love us and who we love, but also in, in religious terms, in terms of a God who knows us, who relates to us, and loves us. And again, all of that comes into this bigger picture of who we are and why we matter. So you're, you're absolutely right. You know, it's, it's not just atoms and molecules. It's not just physical or biological things. It's something deeper. It's something psychological, something sociological. It's something theological as well. And really, it's in this network of relationships that matter. I mean, I was at a friend's funeral on Saturday. He, he was a very close friend of mine and of many other people. And there were a very large number of people there. And actually, each of them spoke of the difference this man had made to their life, helping giving it meaning and value. And I'm sure you know, all of you here today will be able to point to people who have done that for you. I think that's, that's part of this deeper understanding of human nature, and you can see easily how this kind of way fits into a sort of religious or theological context as well. Thank you. I'm going to try in English too. Um, so we've said that uh, there are different aspects of reality and there are different branches of knowledge that use different methods to study that part of the reality. And so when there is a problem, 
uh, that involves all the aspects of reality and you have to find a solution and you find that the solution uh, is uh, contradictory or opposite uh, using its aspect of the of the reality or its uh, way of knowledge what should you do should you uh, choose the one that it's more important for you more true for you i don't know i think that's a very good question and it's a very difficult question and it's a very real question because i can immediately think of situations where that situation arises it happens all the time that if you are absolutely embedded in one way of looking at the world then things become very very simple but um there's a lot of research done, particularly in North America, which shows that most people um, use what, what this research, sociological researcher calls multiple narratives. What he means by that is you'll probably have a number of frameworks or stories that you use to sort things out. One of them might be religious, one of them might be political, one of them might be ethical. Uh, and what you find is that very often you use these narratives for different aspects of your life. That it's, it's almost like I was saying at the beginning, you, like you compartmentalize. But then sometimes you come to a point where you realize, I've got a difficult, complicated situation, and I've got to do something. And each of these elements or components of my life are giving me different answers, which takes priority. And, and it is a very familiar issue, I'm afraid. Um, very difficult, and there are no easy answers. One easy answer is to say, well, I give this perspective priority, and therefore I go where it takes me. But very often what people find is that they, they have to wrestle with this. And that's why they talk to other people about the decision, what they should do. But it, it, it's a really difficult situation. There isn't an easy answer. And therefore, very often what you have to do is simply work the angles of the moral decision you have to make from each of those perspectives, and then in the end make your decision about what you think is right. But what I'm saying to you is that the complexity of this is actually an awareness on your part of how many things intersect on this decision. And in many ways, the people who can make very simple moral decisions are very often those who've bought into one very simple worldview, which gives them an immediate answer. But uh, when you complexify things by realizing it's not that simple, that very often is when you begin to realize these decisions are difficult. So I, I can't really give a good answer to your question, but I recognize its importance. Uh, and um, all I can say really is you have to just try and think through um, what the reasons are, what the outcomes might be, and in the end, very often, we, we have this, this deep feeling within us that this is the right thing to do, even though we're not quite sure where that feeling comes from. I wish I could be more helpful, but I take the point very much. Thank you. Uh, well, this has a, a little bit to do with what she asked. And my question is, instead of knowing each compartment of our lives, like, like you said, like instead of knowing about science, politics, and separating them, and then joining them, trying to join them together, is there a, a way to know about all these things in a broader sense? I mean, not just science and religion, but the both of them in, uh, together. Well, again, thank you, a very good question. Um, obviously, I, I don't want to suggest that my own experience is normative, it's not. But, but my own experience is interesting, which is that um, by inhabiting two worlds for, for quite a long period, I was both a scientist and a theologian, by inhabiting two worlds, if you like, I became bilingual. You know, I, I, I was able to think in two different ways and make connections. And it's not just science, religion, or science, ethics. It's science and ethics and me as an active reflecting thinker, trying to work out how I worked these together, how they became part of my life, and how they informed things. So in many ways, um, the critical issue is science, ethics, religion, the person who is doing the integration. And so what I have found is that um, as I've lived in these communities and thought about these things, I've arrived at certain conclusions which work very well for me. 
I talk to other people who've done the same thing, and they come up with slightly different answers, which help me, but they don't determine what I think. And so what I'd say is, in many ways, and Arouse is a very unsatisfactory answer, as you keep going and think about these things, things begin to fall into place. And so it's, it's about finding a personal synthesis which you feel works for you, but you talk to other people and see how they've done this in case you can learn from them as well. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna try in English too. Um, as I have, <laughs> yes, as I have always gone uh, to a Catholic uh, school, I have always uh, been told the creation of the world and the sense of the world uh, in a, um, following the holy book. So when I start to study in science, I find I found some contradiction about the creation of the world and the sense of the world. I'm asking you if um, do you think the metaphors uh, used by the um, by the um, Catholic, uh, the Christian, concretely, uh, is enough to justify and to argument uh, a connection of the? Thank you. Um, uh, again, a very good question. Um, what, I, uh, what I want you all to do is to imagine that we were meeting 100 years ago. Now, this university wasn't here 100 years ago, but imagine that you're, it's 100 years ago, and we're talking about the origins of the universe. Um, 100 years ago, the scientific consensus was there was no origin. The universe has always been here. And that was basically because there was no scientific reason for thinking that the universe had come into being. But all of that has changed over the last century. So we're now in a situation where, in effect, the standard scientific model is the universe came into being, um, say, 13.8 billion years ago. So what I want you to do is try and imagine the, the massive shift in thinking in science from always been here, came into being. And so obviously you can see that resonates very strongly with uh, a Christian account of creation. But as you say, it's not identical. There's a scientific language of origination, and there's a religious narrative of creation. And they're not the same. And the religious language uses metaphors. It's very, very rich. Uh, and it's not trying to give us a scientific description of how the universe happened. If you like, it's much more trying to answer some deeper questions about why there's a universe at all, and in particular, what, what our place in this universe is. In particular, that question, do we really matter? And for me, that, that is really a very important point, that um, in effect, um, you, you know, we, we might just take a view, we are a cosmic accident and that's it, or we might say, no, no, we don't fully understand this, but actually, each of us is significant. There's something we can do. We're part of a bigger story. We can do something about that. So for me, um, there, are, there are various ways of thinking about this. One way that I very often use is to, is to use an analogy that goes back to the Renaissance in the 15th century, which is to say there are two books that we look at. There is a book of nature. There's a book of scripture, the, the, the Bible, and you, each of these books is different. They're written in a different language, but you can read both of them and try to, try to let them interact. And so for me, a religious language of creation helps us begin to answer questions like, do I matter? Do you matter? Why are we here? It, it doesn't contradict the scientific account of creation, of, 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 of the origin of the universe, but it's rather trying to ask, how do we fit into this? What is there for us to do? And so for me, that's quite an important way of beginning to deal with that. And obviously, there's a lot more that needs to be said, but for me, that's a very important thing to say. It's locating us within this universe and helping us understand why we're here and what we're meant to do. 